Good morning. Happy Dragon Boat Day. Yeah, today's a public holiday in Hong Kong. It's Dragon Boat Day, or as the uh, Cantonese call it, mm. Tun Tun mm. Um, but that's called Dragon Boat. And um, if you don't know what Dragon Boats are, um, when we're done here, because I don't want you stopping this for something else, but when we're done here, go to, go back, go up above on YouTube and type in Dragon Boat Hong Kong, and you'll learn all about it. So, big holiday here. So that's why I'm on an hour later today. Because I thought, why am I waking up early? It's a holiday. It's a public holiday. Plus, I have a sinus infection. And I can't hear anything out of my right ear. It's driving me crazy. But, power through. Anyhow, uh, a few movies opened yesterday in Hong Kong. Three, well, probably more. But, you know, I don't see everything. But let's talk about the three that did open yesterday in Hong Kong. The first one is Fahrenheit 11.9. Which... I don't know why it's come to Hong Kong, <laughs> but actually I think I know why. But anyhow, this is this film uh, is the um, it's the sort of document. It's the well, it is a documentary, but it's sort of the companion piece to Michael Moore's uh, 2018. Uh, the, the not 2018. What did he do? It 2004 film um, Fahrenheit 9/11. Now this uh, film it premiered last September at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's already played all over the world. So, yeah, as I said, why now in Hong Kong? I mean, this isn't really something that interests the average person in Hong Kong. I have a feeling that the distributor is contractually um, obligated to give it a, a cinema release before it ends up on their pay TV channel. So that's probably the only reason. I, I cannot see that this is going to be at the cinema for more than a couple weeks here. It's just something that doesn't interest Hong Kong people. So, um, you know, if you want to see it in the cinema and you're living in Hong Kong, you got, the clock is ticking, let's say. So, um, as I said, it's, it's sort of a companion piece. It, um, it's, you know, not really, a, it's not really a sequel because that one was about George W. Bush. This is ostensibly about Donald Trump, but it does take a few detours along the way to get there. And unfortunately, I think Moore, um, you know, he's never, he, 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 you know, he's not subtle about his feelings about Donald Trump. And, and you know, look, all his movies, he has an agenda. And it's very obvious what his agenda is. He, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to for it. I'm not going to start explaining his agenda. Um, and, you know, this film is no different. So while he, you know, he starts off, he takes aim at Donald Trump, but then he moves on and he goes to, he deals with uh, then, uh, but no longer, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, and then he talks about the all the old white male TV uh, hosts who've been taken down thanks to the Me Too movement, and then he, then he, puts his sights, uh, in, uh, names the sights on Hillary Clinton and the DNC leader. Oh, this is really driving me crazy, and the DNC leadership. Uh, and 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 uh, for their coup, and uh, and even Barack Obama. And I got to admit, the, the scene about about Barack Obama, I didn't know about, it, and I I'm very disappointed in Barack Obama. Look, he wasn't perfect. He's certainly a hell of a lot better than what America has right now. But I was really I was disappointed with with what he did in this scene in the movie, and it deals with the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. And if you if you don't know. Um, I'm sure you can look it up or watch the movie. Now, as I said, it takes a detour, and the first detour, it goes on to the water crisis in Flint, Flint Michigan, which coincidentally, or not coincidentally, oh, yes, no, is where Moore comes from. It's his hometown. So Moore postulates that the situation in Flint with the, with the poisoning of the water and their lack of political will to get it fixed, it's still going on today, it's five years later, still going on today, is, is a government experiment to see how far they can subjugate the citizens without an up, excuse me, an uprising. And, and to back up his point, he, 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 he points to the, the teachers in West Virginia who are living on food stamps, he points to the students in uh, who go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in uh, in Parkland, Florida, and he talks about what they're doing to um, to uh, combat uh, gun violence and the proliferation of, of uh, semi-automatic weapons in America. And, and so he says these are these are tactics that the government 
uh, is is doing to to see how far they can push their push people. I don't know. I don't know that the government's that insidious. Maybe they are. I don't know. Um, but he does he does sort of end off on a bit of a positive note because he says you know you have these you have the teachers the teacher movement that did spread past West Virginia spread to many other states. Um, he talk, you know, and he, he talks to the kids at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and, and what they're doing and, and how wonderful these kids are, how brave they are, and, and how articulate they are, too. And then he interviews now U.S. Congresswomen, but they weren't when they were in his film, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tayyib. Is that how you pronounce her last name? Tayyib? I don't know. Um... And, uh, and and what they're doing and how they're sort of upsetting the apple curd. You know, they're, they're, they're challenging the status quo, the political status quo. Now, what he does say, and this I agree with, it's very interesting. Now, this was an article that came out just the other day, and I was like, really? This article comes out now? But anyhow, um, what he does say in his film is that the, the big problem with the American democracy is that you had with the last election, the 2016 election, is that you had more than, what you have? Not even more, no, you had slightly half, just under half of the country's registered voters didn't vote. And he says, and I agree with him on this, when you don't vote, you get a president like Donald Trump. And, uh, and, and to back up his point here, he says that Clinton lost Michigan and its 16 hugely important electoral college votes by just over uh, 10,000 votes. Now, when you divide 10,000 by the number of counties that there are in Michigan, it works out to about 120 votes per county. That's nothing. You know, can you imagine? That's nothing. And the, you know what? For, uh, Forget about whether Hillary would have been a good president, bad president, whatever. 120 people, that's all they needed, and that would have changed where America is today. So what he says is, you got to vote. Now, so as I was saying, an article came out the other day saying, study just reveals that, you know, the reason why, you know, such and such, such is because people don't vote. Well, duh! <laughs> You know, everybody knows this. I don't know why they needed to commission, or whoever this was, needed to commission a study to tell us that when you don't vote, you get crappy government. You might get crappy government if you do vote as well. It's not, you know, it's not a panacea that you, you know, vote, you're going to get a good government. But definitely, you don't vote, you get a crappy government. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyhow, or enough of my ranting. But, um, you know, Moore, he covers a lot of ground in this two-hour film. But, you know, as I said, he does get lost in the woods a couple times. I think his segment on the, the, the Flint uh, water crisis would have been, you know, if he just would have focused on that, that would have been a good companion to his 1989 film, Roger and Me, which is about the then vice president of, uh, or the then uh, CEO of General Motors, Roger Smith, because Flint is uh, home to General Motors. So it could have, you know, could have worked. Or he could have focused more on the, the, uh, the high school kids, as a companion piece to his 2020, 2022, 2002 film, Bowling for Columbine, or he could have stuck to money politics, uh, you, know, it's, you know, gone off in a whole new direction talking about money politics, as he does talk about it here, uh, and because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject that affects both major political parties, and, you know, he just sort of touches on it and moves on. Or he could have dealt with the emergence of racism and intolerance in America, which he also briefly mentioned. So he had plenty to deal with here. And, but, you know, he, he, he just, oh, oh, look, he even talks about the electoral system, how, how ridiculous it is. And, and he could have even done that. So, you know, there was a lot there that he could have done. But instead, he sort of, you know, smashes it all together. And, and you know, and he, he puts it under the banner of, Beware the man who has dictatorial ambitions. Well, okay, we know. So, you know what? For Trump haters, and I'm a hater, for Trump haters, this film isn't going to get them to loathe the man any more than they already do. It didn't change my opinion of Trump. Didn't make me, didn't make me feel any worse about him than I already do. And for people who love Trump, they're not going to change their opinion of him either. So, you know, it's like, well, what's the point, you know? You, you covered a whole lot of ground here and you have no point. You know, your, your point is sort of like, you know, it's, 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 it's wasted. So the real, the real issue is, um, you know, 
are 100 million people who didn't vote in 2016 going to vote in 2020, and I guess we'll have to find out next year. Hope they do. Hope they do. <laughs> even if it's not 120, even 100, 100 million, even if it's, you know, 10 million, 5 million, it, it'll change the course of who is in office and get rid of some of those politicians, not just Trump, but some of those politicians who really are past their sell-by dates. So Fahrenheit 11.9, it's not his best work, but it's okay. You know, I, uh, is it worth seeing in the cinema? If you're a fan, yeah. If you're not, watch it on TV or in, on an airplane or something. You know, take it or leave it. Next film is that opened yesterday in Hong Kong. is a French film called By the Grace of God, or in French, uh, Grâce à Dieu. Pretty much, you know, by, you know similar, trend, similar meaning. And this is like the French version of Spotlight. You know, the film that, about, that came out a couple years ago, Oscar-winning film, that uh, was about the um, uh, sexual abuse in the uh, diocese in the, in the Catholic Church in Boston. This is like the French version of that. Um, because they have their own, they have their own abuse. <coughs> now, it's very interesting and very, I guess, I suppose it's very disappointing because, you know, the church would love to put this behind them. But, you know, they're saying, ah, you know, what's the big deal? It happened so long ago. Well, it is a big deal and it doesn't matter how long ago it happened. It's, you know, it just shouldn't happen and you have to own up to it. And unfortunately, the courts have said everywhere, the courts have said, look, let's pass the statute of limitations. We can't do anything. These people who committed these crimes, these priests who committed these crimes cannot go to jail for them. It's past the, it's past the time. Um, so that's ra that's rather unfortunate. And even Pope Francis, you know, he did come out, he said, you know, a few months ago, he said, look, you know, we have to deal with it. We have to, you know, we have to confront it. But then in February, he said, well, you know, abuse happens in all sectors of society. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, two wrongs do not make a right. Now, look, maybe he's under pressure from his his cabinet or whatever it's whatever it's called in the church you know to to back down maybe he would like to see more change i don't know but i think that comment was wrong by rationalizing the abuse saying well it happens everywhere that doesn't make it right so strap on some balls francis and confront this evil for what it is now in this film by the grace of god it's a uh, writer director and berlinala darling oh my ears driving me crazy Francois Ozon, he did uh, a film, uh, France, F-R-A-N-T-Z, uh, World War I film, which I saw a couple of years ago here at the International Film Festival. I really liked that film. And he's done another, another film he did quite recently called Double Lover. Uh, you might have seen that one because that one got quite a bit of commercial airplay. So he's now turned his lens on these events in France that are unfolding Right now, you know, it's not the the story is not not even over. So in the film, we have Alexandra. He's played by Melville Poupon. He was in a film called A Summer's Tale. If you happen to have seen it, he's a happily married uh, father of five. He lives in the French city of Lyon. He learns that when he learns that father Bernard Prina, played by Bernard Verlet, um, I don't know what he's been in. To tell you the truth, I don't think I've ever seen him in anything else. Um, he was the priest, you know, Father Prenat is the priest who sexually abused uh, Alexandre when he was a Boy Scout. He's returned to the city to work with children. And, and Alexandre goes to Prenat's superior, Cardinal Philippe Barbarin. He's the Archbishop of Lyon, played by François Martouret, uh, to get the man removed from his post. And Barbarin is very sympathetic to, to Alexandre's concerns, but says no. Doesn't doesn't budge. He says, "Look, uh, we 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 can manage this, you know." And uh, and Alexander sort of gives up. Then the news of of Father uh, Prena's return, uh, sort of, you know, more people hear about it. And another abuse survivor, Francois, play, Francois played by Denis Menochet, he was in uh, Mary Magdalene, and he was in the program. Um, he decides to go public with with his story of personal, of, of abuse. And he creates a support group for survivors called La Parole Libérée, called uh, fr uh, in English freed speech. This is true, by the way. And he finds many others 
uh, they're all men in their 30s and 40s who want justice against the man who, who really messed up their lives in different ways. And one of these men, Emmanuel, played by Swan Arlo, he was in the film Baden Baden. I, you know, when I was looking at his, at his um, filmography, I don't know that I've ever seen him, but I, I, he's got such an expressive face that um, I hope we do see more of him. Anyhow, so for one, so for Emmanuel, his pain is still ongoing. He's he's chronically unemployed, unemployed. He's in a toxic relationship, and he has epileptic seizures when the stress gets too much for him. So, you know, it's just this is not this is not something to, you can just put in your past so easily. Um, but to, so together, the men push the Catholic Church in France to do the right thing, even though some of their family members would prefer to let the past stay in the past. So very very interesting. Now this is this is fairly true. I don't know, you know, the the, the outline of the story is true. He's uh, Ozon has tweaked some of the names of the abuse survivors, but the film follows the events as reported in the French press quite closely. And the director has said that he hopes the film will provoke debate. But as the postscript title card appears on the screen at the end of the film, there's no doubt which side of the debate he falls on. I mean, he's, he is, you know, we're talking about agendas. He had an agenda. Now, be, perhaps because of that, the lawyers for the real Father Prena, real name, Father Prena, tried to block the film's domestic release following Ozone's Silver Bear win at the Berlinale last February, at least until the case against Cardinal Barbara is resolved. But the judge allowed the release of the film to go forward, arguing that the priest has already pled guilty to abusing the boys. So, you know, here's the thing, is that Father Prunas said, yes, I'm guilty, but it's passed, the, stat the statute of limitations has passed, he can't go to trial, he can't go to jail for it, but the one who can go to jail is Cardinal Barbara because he didn't tell the, the legal authorities about the abuse. He knew and he covered it up. So he can go there, you know, the statute of limitations doesn't has not run out on him. So he can go to jail. So that's where the that's where they're focusing is on, you know, sadly they can't they can't get the, the, the pedophile priest, uh, which I think in the film I think they call him a pedo priest. I, uh, there was a there was I can't remember, but there was an expression they called him. They can't go after him, but they can go after his boss. Seems a little crazy, but you know. You take justice where you can get it. Now, I gotta say, all the performances are convincing, especially as I said, uh, the fellow who plays Emmanuel Swan or Wow, 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 wow. Um, but what I found is that Ozone's least compelling character was the first one, was Alex was Alexandra. And and he spends far too much time on his story arc before he moves on to Fran to Francois. You know, he starts out Alexandra's story, then Francois' story, and then and then Emmanuel's story, and then it all comes together. And, and, and what happens is, you know, you're watching the story about Alexandria, and you're going, mm -hmm, okay. And then Francois' story t takes, takes over. And you go, whoa, you know, because Francois is like, the, the actor is, is, is uh, first of all, it's a great story, but the actor, is, I think, he's a much more expressive actor. And uh, so, so the, you know, the, the film sort of ramps up in terms of, of ex excitement, but sort of uh, uh, life, let's call it. And then... When Emmanuel comes on, when Swan Arlo comes on, it really goes into a, a third gear. So I thought maybe maybe this was his intent was to ramp it up. But what I found was you know the first the first third of the film dealing with Alexandra was just it just was too too muted, too slowed down, and it's too much time. And by the time Emmanuel comes on the screen, um, the story you know the film it's already quite you know two hours long. And it's it's too close to the end. And I would have liked to have seen more about Emmanuel and less about Alex Alexandra. But you know, that's me. So um, I also thought, you know, the the film sort of it plays like uh, a, a three part miniseries. And perhaps maybe it should have been instead of a movie. Maybe it should have been a three part TV miniseries because then he could have given Emmanuel more time. So. All right. So, but you know what? Even so, I'd say this is a pretty good film. It's about, about a very topical subject. As I said, this is going on today. And, um, you know, in fact, I, I was just doing research yesterday. In March of this year, so just two months ago, three months ago, two and a half months ago, Cardinal Barbara did receive a six month suspended sentence for failing to report the sexual abuse allegations against. Father Prena to the law enforcement authorities, but his lawyer has said he will he will appeal. 
And on, although uh, Pope Francis has declined to accept the Cardinal's resignation, Barbarin did decide to step aside for an indefinite period. Meanwhile, and this just happened a couple days ago, two days ago, so uh, at the same time that Cardinal Barbarin's trial was going on, we had the trial in Australia and Melbourne for Cardinal George Pell, who was sentenced to six years in prison by a Melbourne court for sexual abuse of two choir boys in the 1990s. So for those cases, the statute of limitations had not yet expired. So he was found guilty of sexual abuse. He was in court two days ago to launch his appeal against the conviction. So, you know, as they said, the church needs to strap on a pair of balls and own up to this, this hideous crime, insidious crime that was and probably still exists in the French church. So I'd say pretty good film on a very on a very topical subject. It's very different kind of film from what Ozan has done. His films are quite often they're sensual. Um, but I'd say, you know, if you're gonna look at all of his films, they're you know they're all provocative. And this one is provocative in a different way though. So I'd say yeah check it out. It's called By the Grace of God. Uh, what's it called? Grâce à Dieu in French. Um, opened yesterday in Hong Kong. Finally, the uh, the last film I'm going to talk about, need another drink, you know, the anti the antihistamines to I'm taking to dry myself up is like drying my mouth. I got cotton in my mouth. Uh, is uh, X Men Dark Phoenix, which opened yesterday in Hong Kong, opens today in North America. Saw it last night, and in case you haven't heard, it is pretty bad. <laughs> you know what I I I love Game of Thrones, but Sansa Stark was not my favorite character, and Sophie Turner is not my favorite actress. She is dull. And I was thinking, you know, and, and my friends and I, colleagues, before this film came out, we thought, oh, Sophie Turner, not a good choice. She is dull to watch on the screen. And, uh, and she is dull in this film, too. But I think the problem with this film is not so much her, it's, it's the writing and the directing. It's a really... It's a. It's not a. It's it's not a good story, and it and it's really low energy. You know what? You should get excited for some of these scenes. And I was like, oh my god, this is like really boring. So I say the the writing, the directing. It's 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 written and directed by Simon Kinberg. He's ri he's written and produced a number of of other X Men films, but this is his first time directing. Oh, uh, not good. Well, look, you can't. You can't sort of say, well, the directing was good, the writing was bad, the writing was good, the directing was bad. He was both, and uh, and all of a sudden he co-produced it. So, you know what, the, the, this time you got to point, all fingers are pointing to him. This is really a bad film, which is a shame because it's, it's, the, it's the final installment in this X-Men series. I think this, the, uh, the franchise gets, uh, well, the franchise, which is Fox, is being taken over by Disney, uh, is part of the merger of the of the two uh, units, and uh, and of course Disney owns the Marvel franchise. So now you know you had Marvel, you had Marvel, some Marvel characters in uh, in the the Fox uh, stable, and you had other Marvel characters in the Disney stable. Well, now they're all going to come together. So you know what we're going to see coming up is probably some some tie-ins between the two franchises. I don't know, but I, I assume. But in any case, you're going to get this whole franchise taken over by a whole different uh, group of people, and uh, they'll they'll have to, you know they're going to reboot this thing, and not a moment too soon because this really what you know what a, what a shame you know this is like the Game of Thrones of of X Men you know it sort of ends with a fizzle instead of a instead of a a pop um, just really dull film um, just and and. Two humongous plot holes. I don't want to get into it, but two like like there were two times I just went. This just is completely illogical, and um, yeah, bad. So uh, you know what? Uh, you know, fans, you, you're going to go see this. If you do see this film, yeah, you're going to say, well, it's better than uh, X Men uh, Apocalypse, <laughs> but anything is better than X Men Apocalypse. Um, you know, you might say, well, it's better than some of the other films, other X-Men films, but some of them were pretty bad too. This just, I'm not going to compare, this just, just a bad film. So, you know what? Watch it at your own peril. All right.
So that's all I'm going to talk about. Just, uh, just very briefly, I'm going to mention on my website, I did a review of the film Deadwood the Movie, which I love, by the way. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet, and you have watched the TV show, you've got to see it because it's closure, baby. It, it just ties up all the loose ends from the show that ran for three years from 2003 to 2006, so you have to watch it. So, X-Men the Movie, the review's on my website, it's howardforfilm.com, howardforfilm.com, and in fact, all my reviews are there, and you can check them out. So, that's it, I am going to try to deal with this year to try to get whatever's inside of me out of me. Have a wonderful Dragon Boat Day, and a great weekend, and uh, happy Shavuot, which is on Saturday night. See ya.